We have one more awesome and inspiring conversation. Uh, some of you may, are you, are you okay? Is things good? Are we fine? Excellent. I'm just asking the question. No. So we have one more awesome and extraordinary panel uh, discussion to have to, uh, for this evening. Some of you may uh, be aware of a publication known as the New York Times. Uh, they're actually published by a company, the New York Times Company. And uh, I've told our guest, our, our uh, guest Arthur Sulzberger Jr., that he may never not publish the Sunday Times ever for the rest of history. And this is actually because if he stops making a print edition of the New York Times on Sunday, I will never be able to afford the bedspreads. Um, it's just a functional reality in my world that every Sunday is the New York Times, every day is the New York Times, the New York Times in digital, New York Times on every device, New York Times everywhere, because I'm a New York Times reader. Now, from an infrastructure standpoint, there are a lot of ways that can happen, but there is only one way it does. And please welcome Arthur Sulzberger Jr. and my very good friend Martin Nisenholtz, who are going to talk about infrastructure, the New York Times, and you. Give it up. Well, so let's get this right. We're all that stands between all of you and a drink, right? Right. <laughs> so before we start, if I could build a little bit on the last conversation we just heard, no. Martin. I but. take that with a question. Mark, <laughs> what was the best no you ever got? And I'm speaking professionally. The, the best or the worst? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Uh, you don't want to know. You don't. You <laughs> do not it, want to know. Was it for me? <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> but you don't want to know. <laughs> Trust me. Then we'll turn it over to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, infrastructure. So I, this is sort of the other side of infrastructure. As uh, I'm sure you all know, uh, newspapers for a very, very long time um, existed in print. They built billion-dollar printing plants. They had trucks, massive fleets people who drove those trucks around, they still do actually, but mm -hmm. it was this infrastructure that really protected many of these franchises from encroachment. And the minute that we turned on nytimes.com in January of 1996, um, all of that sort of began to dissipate. At the same time, you know, you, you go to any meeting and it's, you've got newspapers still publishing tremendous amounts of journalism, broadcasters, mm -hmm. the cable folks, now so many new internet providers. It almost seems like a golden age in some ways of journalism. So which is it, Arthur? I mean, from your perspective, is it a golden age or is it an age of dissolution? Which, 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 which <clears throat> side do you fall on? Well, I, I hate to be uh, come across a little bit uh, against the last uh, presentation, but I think the answer is yes. And what I mean by that is both, yes. It is both a time of dissolution and a time of amazing growth. I mean, the ability now for us, uh, I was just uh, in, the, in the Middle East uh, last week and able every day to look at the New York Times and read the paper, of course I say the paper, sorry I'm an old guy, but read the content um, immediately on my device. And when I started as a, when I was a foreign correspondent uh, in, in London back in the 70s, that was not quite possible. Um, so without, so it's amazing reach. So without the infrastructure, what protects the New York Times? The quality of our journalism. At the end of the day, that is what has got to protect us. And that is what we have to protect. Because at the end of the day, if people don't feel that this is where they can go to get information that they can trust and believe. And that's a, oh, well, was a challenging thought. Um, then we will, we will fade. We will fade away. And that's what we must protect. And the way to protect it, of course, is to find ways, the revenue, to support the remarkable number of journalists we now have around the world, which is more than ever in our history, despite all of the economic pressure we're under. Mm -hmm. So the, the new infrastructure, in a sense, is people. People and intent. People and intent. And the intent is critical. What does the intent mean? The intent means that you've got to be there 
to add value to people's lives and to add value in a way that meets the brand promise. That's, that's what I mean by intent. But let me be clear to all of you in this room, and Martin, you know this better than anybody, this is a very challenging time for us. And right now, thank goodness, because of what we offer, and because of the work, quite frankly, that this wonderful man did for so many years to build oh, us to, to where we are digitally, we are able now to do something that so many of our past competitors simply are not able to do, which is try to meet a growing and a growing international need for quality journalism. So let's, let's switch gears for just a moment. It actually st sticks with the infrastructure theme in some ways. Um, you know, there, there are now two very distinctly different ways to experience journalism. One is to, as you suggested about your trip recently, to go to nytimes.com or one of the apps. Mm -hmm and you experience it directly, right. you experience it through the interface that we build. But the other way is to experience it in some kind of aggregation context. Absolutely right. And the question I guess I have is, as more and more people, particularly younger people, mm -hmm. experience journalism off of the New York Times, is there a business model to that? And if so, how do you think about, how do you think about the relationship b between what, let's just call the, the brand of the New York Times and the new infrastructure, which is principally Facebook, as, as I see it, but well, maybe others there as well. Were, uh, there was a story in today's, today's New York Times which uh, talks about the potential of a, of a partnership with Facebook. I can't get into the specifics of that, but there's, the point is, the thought is that we have got to experiment in new ways of delivering the quality content and monetizing it. And it cannot be any more merely you come to us. It's got to be, we are, you, you know, we, we come to you and we've got to find new ways of monetizing that. And some of it will clearly be digital advertising. Some of it may be enticing people enough to have them decide, yeah, there's, a, there's something here I really truly need and want and I will pay, now start paying for it. Mm -hmm. And to have various pricing levels. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there's the third, which is we find out where your kids go to school, and then we uh, say, hey, pay up. Oh, wait, that's the New York model. Forget that. Um, that was a bad joke. That Sorry, was, folks. That was a joke. <laughs> um, so just as a, a heads up to everybody, today the Times announced an equity investment in a company mm -hmm. called Kiwi, which is an Israeli startup. We actually have a corporate venture fund as, as well, and um, Kiwi is a content uh, marketing company um, that we, along with Eric Schmidt and I think the Marker, Marker uh, folks uh, invested in. And so we've done, now I guess this is the second Israeli startup that we, we invested in. Investors yeah. in, exactly right, yeah. But the, let me go back to the model of how do we, how do we find a way to support our journalists? Um, I think I mentioned that we have uh, roughly, uh, roughly 1,200 journalists, between 1,100 and 1,200 journalists in our newsroom. I, more and we have more foreign correspondents than ever in our history. We have more national correspondents than ever in our history. So at a time when so many of our competitors have, un, you know, been forced to cut back, we've been investing. But paying for that is 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 a challenge. And the pay model that we put into place, Martin, a number of years ago now, we're at nine hundred and ten thousand, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as of the last uh, end of the year, nine hundred and ten thousand paid digital subscribers. This is on top of the roughly 800, uh, what, it's about a million, I guess, paid, billion uh, paid print. But as we, and now our focus has to be growing internationally. And we've made some efforts, mixed success in China, um, but we are now looking at how we can find new ways to engage non-US audiences in a much deeper way. And that's a big part of our future. Yeah. Just as we were once a New York City newspaper, then became a Northeast newspaper, then, thank goodness, a national newspaper, global is, is the future. I just want to take a, a slight detour for, for mm -hmm. those of you who are interested in, in journalism more generally. What happens, Arthur, to companies that don't have the global reach yeah. and scale and potential of the, of the New York Times? I mean, obviously, Every city in America, every city around the world, 
in, in democracies, in any event, need, need mm -hmm. journalism. Yeah. Um, what, what happens? I don't think we have an answer for that yet, and it is a tough, tough time. Um, we've seen so many really great papers that have gone through brutal, brutal times. Uh, the LA Times, Chicago Tribune, uh, we've seen that with papers that we once owned ourselves, the Boston Globe. There, and, and I wish I had an answer for truly local journalism because Martin's 100% right. When you go into the voting booth and you are going to pull a lever for who's your next mayor or city council or even in the United States again, senator or congressman, you'd like to feel informed and it's your local papers that are going to give you the information that will make you understand who makes sense. And I'm not I'm talking about print. I'm not talking about, when I say papers, you know, <coughs> local news sources. Mm -hmm. How we keep those local news sources viable to do the kind of work that allows for democracy to be based on quality in, in, information is, 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 a, is a challenge I don't yeah. think anyone is. I mean, it's interesting because we just saw this presentation from Move It, which I thought was fascinating. Um, I, I, the, infra the infrastructure there, this, this notion of these volunteers, mm -hmm. Um, and that has never, I mean, WikiNews tried that. Yeah. It never really, why? What's, what, what is endemic? We've seen a number of people try it, um, you know, uh, AOL. Uh, well, Patch, uh, Patch, yeah, but that you. was a little different because yeah. it was actually more of a blogging yeah, play than a, than a wiki play. But in any event, it's, you're right, it's yeah. related. And these things just have never kind of taken off uh, in journalism. I'm not talking now mm -hmm. at all about Waze or Move It. Obviously, they're, they're huge companies. But, but in, in journalism, there's something about it that just doesn't work mm -hmm. in a crowdsourced and context. I wish I, wish I, knew, I, knew, I wish I knew the answer. Because in some ways, you could say, maybe the New York Times should, should scale locally in, in addition to globally. We've looked at that. I know. know. Yeah. And, uh, it's, not, it's we've just, not been able to find an answer to that that we could trust. And you know, it's wonderful to have commenters and trusted commenters, but at the end of the day, when you post something and it's coming with your brand promise, you need to make sure you, you do all you can to ensure the vitality of that promise. And yet Yelp has managed to do it in restaurant reviews Remarkable. and in other, yep. but, but every review seems to have five star. I mean, is, is that what you mean by trust? Yeah, it, it, yeah okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. So, so the reason I mentioned Kiwi was not to take us off tact, mm -hmm. actually. Ki no. What Kiwi does is it, it's, it, it finds um, at, at much lower cost than you would be able to find if you were just simply doing advertising. It's a lookalike marketing company, and it finds, on behalf of content providers, new customers. And so from a strategic mm -hmm. perspective, it's a very interesting deal for us because it lets us find potentially new readers and subscribers on Facebook yeah. um, and, in, and potentially in link, on LinkedIn and other social networks. So I just thought it was an interesting deal. And the fact that we announced it today and the fact that it's an Israeli company is just something that you guys should <laughs> be aware is, that, of. That is coincidental, by the way. Totally it's coincidental. not tied I mean, to us being, no, yeah. no, no, but it's, it's an interesting coincidence. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. Quiz, coincidence works in our favor. Sometimes it does, yeah. 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 And the other one is dynamic yield. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Then? So, so uh, I don't, I, I, about three years ago, uh, at actually DLD Tel Aviv, um, I met the, uh, the founder and CEO of, of Dynamic Yield. And what Dynamic Yield does is it basically finds the best, in a sense, the, the, it, it does rapid A-B testing and finds the best way to present content on the page. And so the way we use it is we have these, these modules where we try and move people around the Times website once they're in. Dynamic Yields help, helps us do that. Not on the news side. I mean, the news folks are going to choose the headlines that they want to play. What Dynamic Yield does is it, we have marketing modules on every article page, and it moves these marketing modules around very rapidly and, and, and very effectively and, and causes people to click. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, Dynamic Yield is competing with our own editorial team for clicks. In our own in our own environment. Right. So again, it's a it's a technology company, but one that you know we've invested in for strategic purposes. And you know, again, an, an Israeli company, uh, Liad is a terrific CEO. And so I just yeah. I just thought we would I'm I just thought we would bring that up as, as as well. Now, have we talked about the challenge of of moving? Uh, you know, the 
The challenge of moving from print to digital is obviously one we've been dealing with now for 20, 25 years. Um, but now the challenge is moving from digital to digital. <laughs> and by that I mean from moving from desktop to mobile. Because that is producing, a, that's where everyone is now moving. Sure. Mobile is moving and, and, uh, and the economics of mobile are, are even more challenging than the economics of, uh, of desktop. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about our model, and I think this is where a lot of the other newspapers are going to really have a problem, is that because our model is largely now a mixed model, a subscription and advertising mm -hmm. model, I think the, it's the relationship that the user has with us that matters most. Where, where they use the service, as long as they're paying us, doesn't really matter to you right. all that much, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. obviously, there's an advertising issue mm -hmm. in mobile that still needs to work out. Um, but at the end of the day, a paid subscriber right. on mobile is a valuable thing. But it's fascinating to see how the devices go. And uh, Shelley, you were talking earlier about uh, the Sunday uh, Print, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I once got into trouble by ans answer, answering the question that was asked, when do you think print will be dead? And I think I was at uh, Davos, I think, and I said something like five years, which was in retrospect. Uh, eight years ago. Eight, you know, one, <laughs> and two, but it did, do, do, it did have one, one value. It brought the, uh, the, the heads of our five print unions all together for the first time <laughs> and to come see me, pressmen, nailers, drivers, I could keep going. Um, but I'd like to say now, Shelley, that uh, I think that print will outlast desktop. Because really more and more people are coming to us through mobile devices, iPads, iPhones, et cetera. And, um, and that's really. So what's the, what's the model? If it's, it, did I articulate it properly, or did you yeah, have no, something no, no. else in I mind? Think, I think that you very much did. I think there, the advertising model for, for the phone is still evolving. Uh, and that's going to continue to evolve. Video, is going to play a bigger and Let's bigger role. Let's talk about video. You know, we all, I, I always forget that we have this video unit, and it does. And, and boy, and, there and, is a fabulous video on our homepage right now. I really I, I urge you to look at it, and I know it's going to come uh, I'm saying this, but it's from uh, the first in a series from our Iran-based correspondent. Do we have a correspondent in Iran? So, <laughs> yes. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> So, and, ha and no, no and hostages? Yeah. Don't laugh. No, that's, that's not a, uh, a good joke. There is, of course, a Washington Post reporter who is in jail yeah, so in it's, Iran. It's not, it wasn't a joke. And uh, that is a very tough. I was just <laughs> meeting with uh, one of our journalists, other journalists who's based in the Middle East right now. And this is a very brutal time. Yeah. I mean, um, so how do well, we I mean, we have lost in the last 15 years, we've lost more journalists than we lost in World War II. We've lost more journalists than we lost in World War I. We've lost more journalists than we lost in Korea and Vietnam. Put together all those four wars, we have lost more in the last 10, 15 years in Afghanistan, in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Iraq. This is a very brutal time to be one of those journalists because there's no front line anymore. You all know this, and I know this, but this is a tough time. So how do you protect, how do we protect these folks? Well, we spend a lot of, of money and a lot of training on, on them. And, um, and then we, 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 quite frankly, try to get them to understand that they can only take their, their mission so far. And, you know, they're mission driven. Journalists are mission driven. In fact, they are, the psychology of a journalist is Closest other psychology in the U.S. experience is the military. All right, and we know that that's you know that's both the power and the challenge of getting them to understand how to take it only to a certain point and then back off. But that's the reality of the world we're in now. So, well, great, Arthur. Thanks so much. We're out of time, and I really appreciate well, thank you, your doing this. Thank you. Pleasure. Yep.